Okay, are we, are we ready? <laughs> okay, um, so let me carry, I understand that you're, you're quite accustomed to very long lectures. I have to say that I'm impressed in, in, in England, in Oxford, we have, um, you know, 40 minute lectures, then they get a break and maybe another 40 minute lecture, but no more than two or three in a morning. And you have a whole morning of some guy blabbering on at you <laughs> while you sleep. Um, which uh, I understand, so. Uh. So what I want to do now then is I'm going to talk a little bit about membranes, try and explain what membranes are. But in this, in this particular case, so you know that my expertise has to do with membrane systems, but also um, polymers and surfactants and how they can be used for uh, wastewater treatment or, or drinking water treatment or even resource recovery. But I'm going, going to talk to you now about the use of, a, of a, a kind of process that can be used to treat wastewater. So what we're going to do is to treat the water biologically, but I'm also going to remove everything that's in the water so that effectively it's desalinated, anything that's dissolved is removed, and that water can effectively be um, potable water. So in other words, I'm going to talk about wastewater recycle. And so the title of the talk is Membrane Fouling, uh, and, micro and microbial toxicity in the FOMBR. Now that may mean nothing to you at the moment. Um, if I've done a good job at the end, you'll know exactly what those things mean. So th that's a kind of um, test. So again, this work was done as part of the SPORE arrangement. Um, so Singapore, Oxford. Um, oh, no, I'm wrong. Not, so it's not SPORE at all. This is another collaboration I had with the, um, a university in Pakistan, the National University of Science and Technology in Islamabad. Um, and Pakistan has very serious issues on water quality and water resources. So um, they actually installed a MBR, which is a membrane bioreactor, so that they could recycle all of the water on their campus. It's really a very interesting project. So I was working with some guys for a few years on, on, on trying to improve the performance of the uh, NBR, which is a membrane bioreactor. So um, hopefully you'll find it interesting. So let's carry on. So first of all, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, forward osmosis. So forward osmosis is something I've worked on now for uh, a few years. Um, I'm sure, put your hands up if you've heard of reverse osmosis. I'm not sure how you call it in Portuguese, but it's, it's more, anyway, you know what I mean. So. The question is, why did we always do reverse osmosis and not forward osmosis? Like, we've, we've done things in the wrong order, right? Because forward osmosis is what happens in nature. You know what osmosis is. If you have um, two solutions, one is dilute solute and one is very concentrated, if you put them together, separated only by a very thin membrane, what happens is the water is drawn from the low concentration to the high concentration under osmotic potential. So what it's trying to do is equilibrate itself so that the water has the same concentration on both sides. But of course it can't because the water moves but the salt is trapped. But that's osmosis and that's very important in all biological systems. It's what keeps you standing up because every cell in your body is, is rigid and turgid because water's being drawn in until it can't take any more water in. So it's, it's sort of full of liquid and that's that rigidity is basically, if we didn't have osmosis, we'd just turn into a pile of salts and disappear. So osmosis is very important in nature. And forward osmosis is the natural osmo osmosis, whereas reverse osmosis is where we push the water in the wrong direction. So we push it in the back direction, and what happens is the salt and the water become more concentrated, and the clean water moves through to the other side. And that's how we currently desalinate. But it seems to me that it's the wrong way around because it's against nature. We should work with nature. So I'm going to talk about the promise and challenges of forward osmosis, and then I'm going to talk about a particular kind of draw solution, and I'll explain what a draw solution is in a minute, but no surprise that I'm interested in using my cells because I've worked with my cells half my life. I know quite a lot about them. And then I'm going to show you some results. So I'll talk about the water flux. That's the recovery of clean water from the contaminated water. I'll talk about reverse transport, which is where contaminants start moving back across the membrane in the wrong direction. 
Um, I'll talk about draw regeneration, so you'll understand in a minute what a draw is. And I'll talk about microbial toxicity. Now, why is this important? Well, any membrane bioreactor is really a biotank, and it contains the contaminated water, but it also contains a, co a colony of live bacteria. And those bacteria are very sensitive to the environment. So if we make changes to the temperature or if we add any other kind of material, it may, it may kill them. It may give them a toxic shock. And because we're going to use the micelles, we have to be very careful about that. So I'm going to look at how toxic these micelles might be to the microbes to see if they can survive. And then I'll talk about fouling. And what, what does fouling really mean? Well, the membrane I'm using, so I'm using my membrane. Think about the wall of this glass made from a polymer, and you have another solution on the outside. But as the liquid moves through, it's going to carry things with it, and they're going to stick on the wall. And in particular, the microbes might stick and form a biofilm, or I may get some kind of inorganic contamination. I may get a colloid. I may get something. And all of that, we call it fouling. So just think about any filtration. When you filter, you're filtering something out, it's going to stick on the wall, and you have to get rid of it because if you don't, the flow rate's going to reduce. You're going to block the membrane. You get that? That's, that's what we mean by... So the number one enemy of the membrane technologist is fouling, and, and, and we, need to, we need to solve that. And then I'll do my conclusions. So first of all, I want to explain to you, let's be very clear about osmosis and forward osmosis. So I have two tanks here. I have a tank that's filled with a solution that has a very low solute concentration. So this could be my wastewater. So wastewater turns out has fairly low salinity. It's nothing like the salinity of, of seawater. It has a certain osmotic pressure. But what I'm going to do is, on this right-hand side, I'm going to create a kind of solution. It's a solution that has a very high concentration. But the thing that I put into that solution is something that I can easily remove later. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to separate them with this membrane in the middle. So that's my... Remember, it's semi-permeable because it allows water to move through, but it stops the salt from moving back in that direction. So all the salt's going to... The two salts, whatever I have, are going to stay on either side, but the water's going to move through. And what will happen is... This wastewater, it will become dehydrated. So the water will be removed. It will move on to this side, and this side is going to increase. And what, what I'll have here, this is, my, this is my draw solution. It's going to draw the water, and it will become more diluted. And what I'll then need to do is to treat this draw solution to remove the molecules that are in there, the draw solute, and have clean water. But the point is it's going to be a lot easier to remove those molecules, then remove those molecules. So for instance, what I could do is I could have a kind of magnetic nanoparticle. And the magnetic nanoparticle will confer a high osmotic pressure. But when I'm done, I can just switch a magnet on, and all those particles are going to be removed. And that will give me uh, a clean water. So let's just see how it works. So, so this is where I start. You can see this is my, my slightly saline feed wastewater on the left side, there's the membrane. And this is my draw solution, which I've drawn as yellow because it's got some different kind of solute in there. So at the moment, on this side, I have a lower concentration and a higher and a lower osmotic potential. And on this side, I have a higher concentration um, and a higher osmotic potential. I put those two together. Under natural osmosis, what's going to happen is the water will be drawn out from here into here. So if we do that, so you see what happens. The water has been removed, dehydrated from this compartment, and it's all moved through onto this compartment. That's the water that's moving through. But what shouldn't happen is neither this salt nor this salt should cross the membrane because we don't want to contaminate the draw solution with the wastewater, um, and we don't really want to lose our draw solution back into this direction. But when we do have salts moving across membranes, we call that transport. And unfortunately, no membrane's perfect. So it may give you a 95% barrier, but 5% is lost, unfortunately. So that's a reality. OK. Now, how, did we, how, how might we set this up into a process? Well, this is 
an example of, of how it works. So at the center, you can see here, this is my uh, membrane. And on the left-hand side, I've got a raw feed solution. So by feed, um, I mean, I don't mean food. I mean feed in a, in a sort of engineering sense. This is my wastewater. And I'm going to just keep, I keep circulating it around here. And as it goes round, the water is going to be drawn across into this loop. And what I've got in this loop is the, the concentrated draw solution, which is being circulated in the opposite direction. It's going round and round. And you see how the water is being drawn out from this side into this side. So what will happen is, if I don't remove that water, it's going to build up, and this is going to get more and more diluted. So what I need to do is to have a kind of unit here, which allows me to separate the draw solute, which is the kind of yellow stuff here, from the, the clean water. So as this goes round, it goes through here. This is separated, and that means that I have a diluted draw solution down here. So this is concentrated. It gets diluted because of the osmotic water, it moves into this tank, <coughs> this tank, and then I separate out the potable water, that's the recycled water, and I send the concentrated draw back into the system. Now what's inside of here? Well this, at the moment, it's just a kind of black box, we don't know what's in there, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this into a kind of bioreactor. So what will happen is, Instead of this being a closed loop, I'll have a continuous feed of, of dirty water, contaminated water, which will contain a lot of organic material. And it will get into this tank, and this will act as a kind of bioreactor, and it will break those um, molecules down, the, the microbes will break it down into elemental things or, or basic things like carbon dioxide, or I can run it with methane if I run it as an anaerobic process, but it will also give me uh, water. And the point is, whatever is on this side and is coming through here, only the water is going to move through. So what I'm going to do is recover only water from the system, and everything else will get concentrated. So if I have organics coming into here, the organics are going to get concentrated, concentrated by this barrier because they can't escape. And that's good for the microbes. They like to swim around in a, a slightly higher concentration. However, I'm also going to get a higher salinity and bugs don't like salinity. So what you need to do is use um, specially made bugs which are halophilic. They love the kind of salty environment. And it turns out that bugs are very adaptable. I mean, we're all very concerned now about antimicrobial resistance, right? It turns out that microbes, they can mutate genetically within a matter of hours. So it's amazing. You, you put bugs in here, they actually adapt to the saline environment in a very short amount of time. So that's the kind of principle, and let's go on. So the idea is that forward osmosis uses latent thermodynamic energy, so it's using osmotic energy at zero hydraulic pressure. So remember, reverse osmosis, what we do, it's the opposite way. We apply a pressure, and that pushes the water against the osmotic barrier, and it will concentrate the salt solution, and it will give you clean water on the other side. But that requires a lot of energy. We have to pump at typically 70 bar. It's very high energy. Here, we're just using the thermodynamic energy. So we're using the, the osmotic energy, which turns out to be, it has to do with entropy, really. But um, the details of it are not important at the moment. We just know that the concentrated salt has a lot of osmotic energy. And we're using that to draw the water out. What does it allow? It, it allows a very high rejection of, of the solutes, so that none of the solutes are moving through. Um, because we run at zero hydraulic pressure, we can reduce the fouling. So remember I told you about fouling when you have filtration. But if you're doing the filtration at zero pressure, then there's less tendency for that to stick, so that solves the problem. But it also allows you to have relatively high water fluxes and recovery. So recovery is the amount of water you get out of the wastewater. And it turns out to be quite high. But what are the challenges? Well, we still don't know much about the draw solution. What kind of draw solution should we have? It needs to have a high osmotic, osmotic, osmotic pressure. That's obvious. But it needs to be something that can be regenerated at low energy. 
because we don't, we, we've saved energy here, but we don't want to spend energy here at the recovery stage. It should have low toxicity. Why? Because you can see how the draw solution could move back across the membrane into the, mem into the bio tank. If it gets there, it might kill the bugs. We don't want that. So it needs to have low toxicity, and it must have low fouling. We don't want to foul up the membrane. So that's the first challenge. The next one is the membrane itself. We need to have uh, an optimized membrane which has a uh, low internal concentration polarization. Now, I, I, I won't talk much about that at the moment, but what that really means is that the, the solute builds up on the surface and that causes an additional osmotic pressure, which we don't want to happen. So we need to have an optimized membrane with, with, with low reverse solute transport for the reasons I, I just explained. So let's think a little bit about um, those, both of those problems. So this is a diagram of a membrane. So if you look at a membrane under the microscope, what you find is there are two layers. There's a thing called an active layer, and the active layer is what's doing the separation. It's what's separating the water from the salt. But you also have this thing here called a support layer, and, and you need a support layer just to give it a certain level of rigidity because this is only, um, it might be just 100 nanometers thick. It's very, very thin. So this gives you a certain level of support. So the way it's going to work is you have, uh, I've drawn it the other way, you've got a draw solution here with a high osmotic pressure. This is 50 bars. And here you've got a feed solution which is just two bars. And what's going to happen is water's going to move from right to left. So you see the water's moving in that direction. There's the water flux. But the solute, okay, which is the draw solute, that can actually get through the membrane, unfortunately. So there's a very small leakage of solute transport going in the, in the opposite direction. So there you can see um, how this feed solution has moved to the draw side, and you can see how some of the draw solute has moved over to the feed side. So neither one of those is desirable, but certainly what we don't want to happen is we don't want to contaminate this draw solution with, um, we don't want to contaminate the draw solution with the feed because that, that spoils the draw. We don't want to contaminate the feed with the draw solute because this may be toxic to whatever's in here. So if this is a bioreactor, we have toxic solutes coming through, could kill the bugs. So that's really the purpose of, uh, part of the purpose of the research was, look, was to look at that. So next. So let's talk a little bit then about draw solutions. So the draw solution that I've used in this case is based on a, on a micelle. So here, we talked about this earlier. This is a micelle. You can see what's going on. You've, you've got these molecules that have hydrophilic heads in green, and they have these long hydrophobic tails in yellow, and they tend to form these kind of, they look like drops really, but they're on the outside hydrophilic, so they're in contact with the water. That's good because they want to be in contact with the water. But on the inside, this is very oily, very hydrophobic, and this is where we can kind of dissolve things. So you've got this, this kind of micelle, and often the micelle surface is also associated with oppositely charged ions. Remember what we said in the earlier lecture. So they're, they're often charged. But the point is that these um, micelles are quite big, and they're certainly going to get trapped by the FL membrane. So by having quite a big solute, which is what we've got here, we can effectively ensure that these things are not going to move to this side. They, they can't diffuse very quickly through this membrane. So that's good because means that these things are not going to get on this side and attack the, the bugs. So a, a micelle is a reversible colloidal aggregate. It's made from surfactant monomers. So these, each one of these is a monomer. It's a single molecule which comes together to form a, a micelle, and it's usually dispersed in a liquid phase. So normally this phase the outside phase is water, it's aqueous, aqueous. Um, and it forms above the critical micelle concentration. So you form above the CMC, 
Uh, it also has a thing called the craft temperature. So the craft temperature is a temperature at which the, my the micelles dissolve. And if you go below the craft temperature, the micelles very quickly uh, fall out of solution. So we can actually we can use the craft temperature as a way to regenerate these micelles. If we go above the craft temperature, they all dissolve. If you go below the craft temperature, suddenly they all come out of solution. So that's a way in which we can actually uh, recover them through a very small change in the temperature. So that's how we're going to recover the draw solution. Let's look at some of the properties of micelles. They're quite interesting things. If, if you plot the property of the surfactant as a function of the concentration. So, for instance, if we look at surface tension, we find that the surface tension of the surfactant solution drops until we reach this point here, the CMC, and then look there, you see that the surface tension remains constant. So above the CMC, you're forming these micelles, and these micelles are not changing, and that means that above that point, most of these properties remain the same. So you can see that osmotic pressure is constant, uh, surface tension is constant. There's an increase in turbidity because we have these small colloids. Um, there's an increase in the magnetic resonance. Um, there's a drop in conductivity and self-diffusion. But you can see here that the osmotic pressure remains constant. And that's useful as well because it means that we can easily control the system. The osmotic pressure is fixed. From an engineering point of view, it makes it a lot easier to, to control. Now, I mentioned to you the, the craft point. Imagine that we're trying to measure the solubility of monomers. So you know that as you increase temperature, generally solubility will increase almost exponentially. Now, if that concentration is higher than the CMC, that means there's enough monomers dissolved to form micelles. And once we cross that point, the solubility increases very rapidly. So, so this is the important thing. You see here there's an almost vertical line above which we have an infinite solubility of micelles, but below which we have a very low solubility. So if we change the temperature around that craft point, we have a way to dissolve or to precipitate the micelles out. And that means that, first of all, we can make a draw solution, say, at 30 degrees, we have a very high concentration of, of micelles. When we're finished and we want to recover the draw solution, we just drop it to 25, so it doesn't really require very much energy. It, it, it's going up, it's around ambient, 25 to 30. You can get to 30 using waste heat from the back of a condenser, there's tons of it, any power station will give it you. And then take it back away from the condenser into the ambient temperature and it's coming out. So it's good from a sustainability point of view. So what are the research questions? If we use these micellar drawers, will they yield a, a constant, stable flux above the critical micelle concentration um, and therefore allow improved process control? And the second one is, can we regenerate them, as I've mentioned, using low-grade heat and temperature swing around the, the craft point? So that's the second research question. Third one is, do micelles confer a low reverse solute transport. We don't want them to come back into the feed tank because it's going to upset the bugs. So they should have a low transport. Do they exhibit low toxicity in the membrane bioreactor? So this is, this is really the issue. How toxic is that stuff um, to the membrane tank, to the bio tank? And finally, is membrane fouling reversible by, by cleaning? So can we reverse the, the fouling by by cleaning. So we just go back. Just um, another point I want to make. This is a good way to start a PhD thesis. When you start a PhD thesis, have very clear questions in mind. What are your research aims? Because that's what you're going to present at, at the end of your project. You have to answer these questions. So have, have four or five clear research questions and answer them. And if you answer them scientifically and correctly, I think you'll pass. So this is really a diagram of the, the, the apparatus. You can see I've got two loops. Let me talk, talk you through them. At the heart of this, I've got the membrane cell, and I've got two circulation loops. So the first one is coming out of the draw solution. It's moving through the membrane cell, and it's going back into the tank. 
So this is what's going to draw the water out. And I've also got a feed, so I've drawn it a sort of dirty brown color because it's um, wastewater. So this is really my sort of bio tank. And again, that's being pumped into the membrane cell on the other side of the membrane. So the water's being drawn across, and then it's going to come back into the loop and back into the, the feed tank. So in this case, what I can do is um, I can weigh the amount of water in the feed tank and the amount of water in the draw tank. And as they change, that allows me to measure the flux. So the difference in weight will tell me the amount of water that's moved through. So I've got it connected to a, a little computer. Now, let's talk about the FOMBR. So that stands for Forward Osmosis Membrane Bioreactor, FOMBR. Uh, and the way that that's working is, as I mentioned before, I've got a wastewater that's coming into a tank. So this looks very much like an activated sludge process, which is the main kind of process that's used for wastewater treatment. Um, it was invented in Manchester in 19, I think it was 1910. Arden and someone, yeah, you've read the paper. So we just had our centenary. Um, so here's the bio tank, and what I've got is inside of that, I've got this membrane, and in the membrane you see that I'm doing this circulation of draw solution. On the right-hand side, this is my recovery of draw solution. So I mentioned before I can use waste heat, and that could be, um, it could be solar heat, or it could be waste heat, doesn't matter, it's, it's cheap heat. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to generate clean water, that's the important thing. And here, I'm going to generate sludge, and I may add air if I want to do that aerobically. If I want to do it anaerobically, I can generate methane, so I can get even more out of the system. So, so it's really quite uh, efficient. So what are the advantages? Well, I don't need hydraulic pressure to run this, and that means that I have a reduced tendency to fouling on the membrane. I don't eliminate it, but I can reduce it. Um, I have less air scouring, if I have less fouling, I have less scouring. So what happens with normal membrane bioreactors is you, you get biofilms that build up on the membrane and you need to use a lot of air bubbles. We call it sparging in English, but it, it, it's breaking the biofilm with the bubbles. And we don't need to use as much of that, so that reduces the energy use. But also this membrane, um, it's no longer ultrafiltration, which is used for the MBR. It's, uh, an osmosis membrane, which means it rejects just about everything. So it rejects suspended solids, it rejects the organics, and that means that they are retained. And that means that, in this case, the organic retention time is much higher than the hydraulic retention time. So it really sits around in there, and that allows the bugs to, to break it down. So what we find is that the dissolved oxygen concentration or dissolved organic content in the treated effluent from this type of membrane bioreactor is much lower than it would be uh, in a conventional MBR. And therefore, we have an enhanced removal of micropollutants. So not only is this has a lot of potential for domestic wastewater treatment, but it means that we can start to think about removing priority pollutants. Now, you've heard of priority pollutants, right? These are things that start to emerge on the radar of compounds that are not being removed by activated sludge. So things like pharmaceutically active compounds, things like um, metal ions we mentioned. Um, there's um, endocrine disrupting compounds, which are part of um, estrogen type materials from wastewater. All of these things are having a big effect now on the environment. It's a big issue in Europe. I'm sure it's an issue here too, yeah. So point is that this is a very tight membrane and it's going to trap those things. So there's an additional advantage. Well, I've told you the plus sides, of course, there's downsides because we still have to sort this draw solution out. So let's move on. So in this study, we used a range of different kinds of surfactants and I've tried to give you some details. So here, um, for instance, I've got sodium dodecyl sulfate which is an anionic surfactant. It has molecular weight quite high, um, and it has quite a low CMC. 
so critical micelle concentration. On the other hand, I've got this, this is cationic. So this is tetraethyl ammonium bromide. And this um, has a, a slightly higher CMC. So if we use a higher micelle concentration, it means that we probably will have a higher osmotic pressure. But on the other hand, a higher concentration means it may be more toxic and it may have a greater tendency to diffuse uh, across the membrane. A couple more here. This is octane sulfonic acid. So this is um, another anionic uh, material. And then here I've got trimethyl octyl ammonium uh, bromide. So there's, there's a lot of things that, that you can play around with. You might also use things like fatty acids or natural surfactants, which have the advantage that they're likely to be le less toxic to the microbes, whereas we know that certain kinds of cationic um, surfactant, particularly ones that have branch chains, are rather toxic and are very difficult to break down, in fact, in the environment. So those were the things that were used um, in the study. Here's some more. I, I, we, oh, this was the, um, yeah, this was, this was the feed to the biotank. So we used a kind of synthetic wastewater. But what we did is we gave the bugs a nice, nice cocktail so that they could sort of happily eat that. And, and you see, this, this is sort of standard stuff. It's a mixture of glucose, ammonium chloride, phosphates, chlorides, sulfates. So you've got, um, you've got phosphates, you've got um, this, which is the main sort of substrate. But you've also got lots of different salts <coughs> and a pH buffer. So that was the synthetic water. And then we used this species, Erigenosa, which was inoculated into the wastewater, uh, incubated overnight in a shaking in incubator for, for 24 hours. So, so we had some kind of real, or not real, some kind of synthetic uh, wastewater which was starting to, to react. In terms of the surfactant, we uh, lowered the temperature of the diluted draw solution to below the craft temperature, and then we were able to recover the crystals of the surfactant or, or filter them using ultrafiltration. So either way, we could recover the uh, draw solution. Toxicity, what we did was we, we did some batch tests over a couple of days for um, cultures of the bacteria. Um, and also we used the mixed uh, activated sludge to see how well they could withstand the toxicity issues. And finally, we looked at fouling and cleaning. So we tried to remove any surfactant fouling using um, EDTA. So EDTA is quite a good sort of sequestering agent. It will remove a lot of uh, organic and inorganic ions. But also we use sodium hydroxide, which is a little bit more aggressive to remove that. And we use both hollow fibers. So I, I've implied that the membrane is flat, but sometimes they can be little capillaries. So they can be little tubes with a very fine hole. You think that your hair is actually a kind of capillary, something like that. Um, so hollow fiber and flat sheet FL membranes um, in a particular configuration that would allow it to, to, to work. Just want to show you some pictures of membranes, what they look like. So I mentioned hollow fiber membranes. That's what they look like under the microscope. And you can see this is a thin film composite membrane that's been fabricated with polyether sulfone. So you can see um, on the, I think the outside is the support layer and the inside is the active layer. So instead of having flat sheets, you can roll them into fibers. But the beauty of that is it gives you very, very high surface areas. So you can pack in a very high surface area of membrane. And what you have is these modules with lots of little fibers packed in um, to work well. This one is a tri-bore thin film composite. So somehow I've managed to have three holes rather than just one, three cylinders going through rather than one. And this is a dual layer FL membrane. So it's got both, um, it's got basically two layers on either side. You've got two active layers, two support layers. So that, that, um, that's a kind of double, we call that a double skin membrane. Um, if you look at the support under the microscope, you can see there that this is at the scale of 50 microns. So this is a very open structure, which means that it's easy for anything to get through. So it doesn't have an ability to separate, but it has an ability to, to support the, the, the membrane. 
Okay, so these still need, um, they still need optimization, but, so that's not something that we've looked at, but that's an area of active research. So the challenge is to fabricate a membrane which minimizes both the concentration polarization and the, and the fouling. Um, yeah, we might have to push it a few times. So I just wanted to explain to you, this is kind of the details of what goes on in the membrane. So just imagine that this is your active layer here and you have two solutions. You have a feed solution and a draw solution. If you measure the concentration of the draw solution across that, you can see that it's changing. So as it gets close to the layer, it's dropping slightly because um, as the water moves through, this, this part of the solution gets diluted. So that's what we mean by concentration polarization. And similarly on this side, the feed water is moving through um, and the solute gets trapped, but it can't, it can't diffuse back. So it gets trapped in this, in, in, in this layer here. And what that means is the effective osmotic pressure is the difference between here and here. And that difference is smaller than the one between there and there. So that's really what we mean by concentration polarization, and, that, and, and that's uh, an issue. So the challenge is to fabricate a memory which min minimizes both that uh, and the fouling. Okay, so here's some results for uh, water flux. So the first one, um, we have um, a diagram of flux against concentration for various configurations. You can see um, active layer, against the draw solution, and we try to fit that to, to a model. But you can see that basically, as the concentration increases, the, um, the flux is, is increasing. And that, in this case, we had a flat sheet membrane. I think that was using the TA, AB, and the SDS. So you, you can see basically that the fluxes are quite a bit higher for the TEAB than they are for the SDS. Remember I said that TEAB had a higher CMC, had a higher micellar concentration, which gives it a higher osmotic pressure. So you can see that certainly for higher osmotic pressures, you're getting higher fluxes. But we don't get the constant flux we expected from the earlier diagram because of the concentration polarization. So that's affecting the osmotic um, pressure. And here's another diagram of water flux over time. So there's a lot of data here, but basically what you see is that the flux is declining. So you see how that flux is declining. So there's, there's a couple of things that are going on there. As the draw solution gets to be more and more diluted, the osmotic pressure has decreased. But also we have some fouling on the membrane, and the fouling is causing that flux to to decrease as well. So in both cases, you can see that I might have to stop that process and clean the membrane so that the flux is going to um, recover. And again, I've got some diagrams here of, of flux, so I can't remember. Yeah, maybe nothing particularly interesting to, to show you there. Let's move on. So here I've got uh, a monoculture. So this is just to remember that we've got the synthetic wastewater and we're looking at water flux with time. So you can see I've got these different surfactants. I'm using the TEAB and the SDS. So there's my TEAB. It's reasonably stable. The SDS is dropping off quite a lot more. But I've also compared it with um, a draw solution that's made from sodium chloride, and you can see that that's, that's also quite stable, um, whereas the TEAB and the SDS uh, seem to be less, less effective. Um, yeah, okay, let's move on. Now, one of the issues that I was concerned about was the fact that the draw solution might move across the membrane back into the feed tank. <coughs> so what I did was to look at the, here, this was the draw solution concentration for these different types of draw solution. And what I did was measure the reverse transport back into the um, tank. 
So you can see, for instance, that if I have NA NACL, that um, the reverse transport, I'm measuring it in, in milligrams per litre. So they're quite low concentrations in the feed tank. But you can see that certainly NACL gives you quite high reverse transport because NACL is a very small molecule. It can move easily through the membrane. It's not being completely trapped. Whereas you can see that for all the surfactant molecules, these numbers are quite small. So in comparison, and, and this number in brackets is the ratio of that molecule to the salt molecule. And you can see that the numbers vary, but they're sort of of the order of 50, 30. Here it's sort of 200. Here it's sort of 89. The point is that in all those cases, the reverse transport of the draw solution is much lower for those much bigger molecules than it would be for, for salt. So that seems to confirm the idea that having a big molecule for the draw solution is going to be more effective. Here I'm looking at regeneration. Um, so for instance, if I take an SDS, I, that's the osmotic pressure at one bar. That's my CMC, it's quite low. If I use a craft technique, I can recover about 58%. If I just use ultrafiltration, I can get it up to 95%. But you can see that it's reasonably well recovered. If I use TAAB, which has a slightly higher molecular weight, I can recover up to 90% or 99%. So that's working even better, as is the case for the OSA, whereas the TOMAB doesn't work very well at all. So I think the point that this is trying to say is that if you use this craft phenomena, you can recover quite a lot of those molecules, but it's not perfect. So we have some distance to go on this. We, we haven't really got to the high recoveries we'd like, but it seems to... Um, it seems to work reasonably well. So let's look at toxicity. What happens if we actually mix the Pseudomonas aeruginosa with, with the different kinds of draw solution and we, le we leave them over time? So this is um, TOC. Now, if the um, TOC um, is reducing, then it means that the bugs are still pretty much surviving and, 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 and working. And you see that as you add the concentration, so I start at um, very low, I start with a control, which is this one. You can see that the TOC is dropping over time, which means the bugs are still alive. They're, they're still eating the organic content. But if I increase here up to the red, you can see that they've actually survived quite well. So the surprising thing is that the bugs are reasonably resistant to the presence um, of these solutes. And that was quite surprising. I mean, they must be adapting or doing something smart to, to, to do that. So we did the same kind of thing, but using... Um, this is activated sludge. So this is a whole consortium of different kinds of bugs. But again, you see that, that, that they seem to, to, to survive. So this is, this is really a growth count. And you see the same thing in reverse. They're still growing in the presence of the solutes. Um, down here, with the sludge, you see it's not doing so well at the high concentrations. So for very, very high concentrations of draw solute, you see that the bugs are not growing quite as well. So, so there's a bit of a problem there. But it's still not bad. I mean, the point is, that's 0.05 molar. And you'll never have that concentration building up in the feed tank because you've got the membrane in place. So it seems to work pretty well for the bugs. Um, maybe not so well for SDS. So when we have high concentrations of the SDS, look at that. It's, it's, um, it's not doing very well. So the TOC isn't changing very well. It tells me that the bugs are not eating. They're not well. They're not eating what they need to eat. Um, and then you see again with the growth here, when you add... Um, Okay, that one's here. You see that in the presence of the sludge, they're not doing very well at all for SDS. So SDS doesn't work as well um, in this application because it's a little bit toxic to, to the bugs. And this is just some sort of summary of what happens with the different draw solutions, at different um, CMCs. So here we're calculating the maximum reverse transport 
this was the growth of activated sludge um, after 48 hours as a percentage of DI water. And you can see that SDS, the growth is much smaller than it is for the other surfactants. So SDS seems to give us a bit of, bit of a problem. Um, if we use the individual organism, then it's slightly better, but it's still not wonderful. And these, these are quite low numbers down here as well for those two. Um, but maybe it doesn't matter because this is the thing that matters. So this is the growth of the bugs in the presence of the reverse transport after 48 hours. And that's a percent of DI water control where, where we have no, we have no um, toxics at all. And you can see they're all 100%. So, so maybe this doesn't matter. Maybe the, the membrane's enough barrier to stop the toxicity from moving through. So that's quite, quite encouraging. So the bugs are surprisingly resistant to the draw solution, and I think that's very, very good news. Finally, on cleaning, so, so this is a graph of what happens to the flux with time. You can see how it's dropping because it's fouling up on the membrane surface. So what we do is we stop it and we, we, we clean it, and then it recovers, and then it drops again, and then it recovers. Um, here you can see in more detail, this is, the, this is what happens after a first cleaning. We clean it with EDTA or with um, hydroxide, and then it recovers again. So both, both types of membrane we used here. We have um, a flat sheet and a hollow fiber. So membrane cleaning with um, EDTA and some sodium hydroxide for 30 minutes. And in the second case, we did the same just using the, the sodium hydroxide. So there's uh, A, B, and C, I think it is. But in all cases, we get some recovery. But this, this, is, this seems to work the best because you get almost 100% recovery. So, so you can clean the membranes. It's not, it's not too difficult to clean it using these um, solutions. So I think in conclusion, what we can say is that micellar solutions can produce modest but acceptably reasonable water fluxes that remain relatively constant above the CMC. Not exactly constant, but relatively so. And that tends to yield um, stable fluxes, which are insensitive to the effects of concentration, polarization, etc. We find that up to 99% of the surfactant can be recovered using um, either craft temperature swings or ultrafiltration. Um, but some monomer may always remain, and we may need to polish that using a nanofiltration. We find that the micellar reverse transport, so that's the draw solute moving back into the feed tank, is negligible compared with the use of inorganics like sodium chloride. Um, and that means that there's negligible toxicity in practice being introduced to the microbial species in the tank. So that's good because the bugs can survive. Um, and we find that the, the FL membrane itself can be cleaned easily by using a mixture of EDTA um, and sodium hydroxide. So really, I would say that for these surfactants, the best applications are probably suited to, um, to non-potable water, to wastewater treatment, uh, and to the FL MBR, which is what I've, what I've shown you. And I think that's probably it. So again, some acknowledgments. So it's myself, and that's my colleague at NUST. That's Dr. Sherjamal Khan. And then here's Saqib. He was uh, doing his uh, PhD at the time. And now he's finished his PhD. And then another student is, yeah, you can see her. She's, that's Gabriela Cadella. She's Brazilian. She had a, a CAPES scholarship. Um, and um, who else? I think that's another one of my DFIL students. And then the people I collaborated with in Singapore, so this is Professor Wang Rong, um, who's doing a lot of work now on forward osmosis, and Chu Yang Tang. Okay. So I think uh, that's 12 o'clock. We managed to survive the morning. <laughs> Thanks, for your... Thanks for your attention. Um, any questions? Speak into the mic because there are people 
Um, I think uh, that uh, biological treatments are reaching a dead end. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about it? <laughs> well, bugs are bugs, and um, uh, oh, sorry. It, it's a good point. You know, we, we the bugs can only do what they can do. We try to improve them with um, genetic engineering and. and you know, that kind of, of thing. But really what we're trying to do here is to push it from the other end and improve the physical separation of what comes after the, the bug process, you know. So I, I don't think we can do a lot more with the, um, you know, with the biological process, but I think what we're trying to do here is to make sure that at least we have a clean water which is, you know, low energy. Um, but the next generation of, of MBRs or, or biological reactors is probably beyond my expertise. <laughs> I'm not a bio pro person. I think we should acknowledge the presence of the um, audience from Pernambuco and from Campo Grande, so welcome. And do ask your questions via WhatsApp if you wish to. Any more questions or comments? Uh, John, uh, John, uh, Johnny. Hi, uh, my name is Jonathan. Yeah. And I have a question, but it's about the first lecture. Is, is it OK to, yeah. to question about it? OK. Um, you were talking about the metrics and the measurements when we are evaluating the environmental impact. And sometimes, we have limited data to analyze, and sometimes uh, we have to estimate, or even though we have no data, absolutely no data to work on. And what do you do when you have this situation? And if you ha can have, can give you an example in the UK, uh, especially in Brazil, we have no data or very few data about solid waste management in the municipalities and it's very difficult to uh, propose projects or even plans without uh, data well that's i mean very good question um of course there's no easy answer to that um in the U in the uk we have the Environmental Protection Agency, who basically are paid with government funding to go out and make measurements on water quality, air quality, um, you know, the quality of the environment in general, but it, it costs money. Um, I've no idea about how Brazilian legislation works in that respect uh, and how far it needs to go forward, but if you can't rely on agencies, you have to go and find it yourself, and that probably means that you'll have to collaborate with people who work in a uh, biology department or ecology department or environmental science. So the people who go out and make very careful environmental uh, measurements. But um, I don't think you can get away from the fact that that data is extremely important. And it may be, if, if you're um, proposing a project and you want to do something like that, it might be good to include in your proposal some funding that would allow you to, to make those measurements. Um, so in the case of solid waste, um, you must have some idea of the kind of metrics that you would want to, to monitor. Would that be to do with, uh, it's not sludge, you, you, you mean more to do with general solid waste? Um, yeah, yeah. Can you repeat? Yes. Um, we would need uh, to know the organic fraction and also the recycling and rejection fractions of what is generating in the city. And yeah. sometimes we don't have this kind of data. And have you had conversations with uh, municipal authorities or with companies that handle the waste, or did they just tell you to go away? <laughs> is, is it talking to a brick wall? You know? Yes, most <laughs> of the time. Most of the time, yeah, yeah. But those guys seem as if 
they don't care. Um, is there a, a legislation that will put a pressure on them? I mean, it may come down to mm -hmm. politics that you need to have a, a government legislation that would force them to be responsible for the kind of waste that they're creating and, and the environmental impact they have. So as a scientist, it's very, very frustrating not mm -hmm. to have access to the data. But you have to be realistic about how much change you can affect to, to bring that. And otherwise, you'll have to go and get it yourself. And that takes time and money, but c'est la vie. One question here, this group here. I'd like to know if you had used that in a larger scale, in a real scale, any of that technologies you spoke about. So are you referring to the membrane technology or to the flocculation? If you can't, both of them. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, the answer is no, um, not yet. I'm a, obviously a research scholar. Most of the work I do is, is on a lab bench probably the similar one that you work with. Uh, and designing and building systems at very large scale can be quite tricky. There are issues of scale up, of engineering um, and management. Uh, but what I can tell you is that for the earlier presentation about the polymer surfactant process, indeed, we are going to build a, a larger pilot plant. That will be part of our mission as a company. Um, and it's really the only way that you can demonstrate the effectiveness of that process at a real scale. Because otherwise, I'm sorry, people laugh at you. They say, oh, you've done that on a bench scale. It's oh, people in the university, they live in a world, a world of their own. <laughs> That's how industry think about us, you know. So you have to do that sooner or later. And, and there are serious issues. You know, you have to think about the kinetics start to have a very big effect on a larger scale. The, um, the rates of the processes, the mixing, the flocculation, the mass transfer, the diffusion, um, all of those things that take time start to play a bigger and bigger effect because basically the surface area to volume ratio starts to decrease for a bigger system. It's just second law of thermodynamics, you know. So it's a very, very good question. And the answer is um, it has to be a priority for any self-respecting engineer. <laughs> I know that Eduardo has some very nice pilot plants up in the other campus and I've seen them. Thank you. Thank you. Ash? Just one more. Yeah. Um, the physics tells us that nothing is perfect and recycling it, it's not 100%. Yep. So yeah, can you comment on that? You're absolutely right. Um, and in my evening lecture, I'm going to talk a little bit about the second law of thermodynamics. If you think about the second law of thermodynamics as a heat engine, that tells you that you can put in high quality heat and what do you get out? You get work, you get useful, but you also get waste heat and you cannot avoid it. It's impossible to avoid. So think about a normal combustion engine in a car in a Carnot cycle, running at maximum efficiency, it's about 43%. What you get at the wheels is probably like 5% because it's lost in, in waste. You know. But the same thing applies to any process. That A process, what that's doing is it's taking um, something useful, a kind of resource, and it's turning it into another resource and a waste stream. And I believe that it's impossible to ever have a process that's 100% efficient because it would contravene the second law of thermodynamics. You can't have a perpetual motion machine. You remember those diagrams where you have a wheel with balls that keep spinning around, you know? It doesn't work because when the ball falls down, it loses energy through heat. And that's really just the second law, that, that work, um, that, that energy is converted into both work and heat, and you can't have, uh, sorry, to work and waste heat. So I think that's absolutely correct. So anyone has another question? No? So we would like to thank Professor Nick for his time here to spend a little bit with us, share his knowledge. 
And we see you tomorrow again at 8 o'clock here. Ah, no, no. Today at 5 we have the, the lecture, the open lecture for the entire university. So if you want, you can call other colleagues. And we see you again at 5 then. And tomorrow at 8. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nick. Thank you.